In early April 1945, the Red Army approaching Berlin, the beeline from the Kustrin bridgehead on the Old River to the capital of Germany made 60 kilometers. But everyone, from the ordinary soldiers to the commanders, realized that it would not be easy to cross these miles. The Liberators were faced with the largest battle in the world's history, the Battle for Berlin. And as well as throughout the war, the Soviet infantry was to play a major role in the battle. Those were both the experienced frontline veterans and the young soldiers who had just arrived at the front. Alexander Rodichev, Yevgeny Agapov, Ilya Sokolov, and others in the Infantry of the Liberator series. We will the field manual as of 1942 read, the infantry fulfills the most difficult task, close in combat, chest to chest with the enemy, the decisive advance of the foot troops during the attack, and their stubborn defense decide the fate of the battle. The fire and maneuvers, and the close in fighting are the main methods of operation for the infantry. All the efforts of the artillery and aviation, armor, sappers, and other troops were focused primarily on the support to the infantry units. The infantry was the first to stand in the way of the enemy to organize the defense. It was the infantry who liberated the towns and villages, and therefore bore the main burden of the war. With the outbreak of war, the Soviet Union started the total mobilization. The first wave fell in summer 1941. They called up young men born in 1918 to 1923, except for the workers at the munition factories and the rural tractor and combine drivers. Military mobilization, volunteers were recruited as partisan units and citizens in arms. Yevgeny Agapov recalls, Soon after the war began, my elder brother Ivan was killed. I wanted to take revenge of the Nazis for my brother and went to the recruiting office. Naturally, most of the recruits were assigned to the infantry. The recruits were given the outfit of one or two sets of uniform, two pairs of underwear, a cap, a belt, a coat, a pair of boots, and foot wraps. Before the war, at the recruiting office, every soldier was given the Red Army Soldier's Military ID, which was the only document providing his identity. The recruits also received the Identification Medallion, or the so-called Death Medallion, an octagon shaped bakelite container with a screw cap. Inside the container, there was a record card where every soldier had to write his own name, rank, and other identification data. Alexander Rojachev recalls, We would throw out our death medallions. We had to write all the personal information in them. But there was a superstition there that since you recorded your identity, you were going to be killed. However, under Order N-171 in 1940, the Red Army soldiers' military IDs were abolished for the field troops. Thus, at the beginning of the war, practically all ordinary Red Army soldiers and junior commanders taking part in the battles had no identity documents with them. 
As a result, in 1941 to 1942, there were thousands of people armed and dressed in the Red Army uniform, but without IDs in the Soviet rear. Those were soldiers who simply had failed to keep up with their military units during the retreat and who had no chance to prove their identity. The German military intelligence quickly took the advantage of the situation. They sent hundreds of sabotage and espionage groups to the Soviet rear. The Germans did not have to bother even about the fake documents for them. Those German troops who were engaged in catching the Soviet soldiers in the encirclement were faced with a peculiar difficulty. The Germans often could not identify the person they detained. Was it a military man dressed in civilian clothes or a local resident wearing his old soldier shirt? In these circumstances, the Germans would arrest all males of military age, for example, from 18 to 50, and sent them to the detention camps. soldiers IDs with the photo was reintroduced in all the Red Army units under Stalin's order. Still, many of the soldiers did not have it until the end of the summer of 1942, but the recruits received their military IDs. The document contained all the identity information about the soldier and the uniform. Wrapping one's feet with footcloths was the first skill a recruit had to master. From the very beginning of the war and till the victory day, the day's long marches were a part of the infantry's everyday life. With his feet wrapped in properly, the soldier would have corns, ulcers, and as a result, fail after a day or two days of march. Moreover, an infantryman had to carry his weapon, hand grenades, coat rolls, backpack, gas mask, helmet, small shovel, field pouch, and three or four pouches with ammunition. Meanwhile, the backpack alone could be weighty enough. Unsurprisingly, during the long marches, the soldiers tried to get rid of extra weight. Sometimes the foot soldiers had to make up to 60 kilometers per day. The senior lieutenant, Mikhail Lukanov, recalls, My old boots failed to survive the quick marshes and bad weather and began to fall apart. One of my soldiers took the boots off a killed soldier and gave them to me. They were blood-stained, but water can wash away anything. Many of the soldiers wore Jack's boots with putties instead of knee-height tarpaulin boots. The putties were taps of rough cloth, 3 meters long and 10 centimeters wide. The putties overlapped the boots, wrapped the soldiers' legs with the trousers up to the knees, and were tied under the knees. This, of course, did not turn the Jack boots into knee-height tarpaulin boots, but still made them warmer and prevent them from leaking. The foot marches were an ordeal for the soldiers. The terrible fatigue made them fall asleep literally on foot. Sometimes a soldier would walk, holding his hand on the soldier of the one in front of him, or they would walk by threes. 
Two soldiers armed the third one, who was walking asleep, and then they changed. Ivan Garcia recalls. For me, the worst thing in the war is the attack and hand-to-hand -hand fighting and the marches. Eventually, the spring of 1945 came. The soldiers were making the last marches of the war. The Red Army was approaching Berlin. By mid-April of 1945, the German army still had more than 200 divisions and brigades. Hitler hoped to prolong the war and to make separate peace with Great Britain and the United States. Meanwhile, Churchill, in defiance of the agreements between the Soviet Union, the United States and Great Britain, suggested stealing a march on the Red Army and occupy Berlin. Hitler sent the main Wehrmacht forces to hold the front against the Soviet Union. The Red Army headquarters were faced with the need to immediately occupy Berlin, approach the River Elbe, and meet the Allied forces. The plan of the Berlin operation provided for a simultaneous attack of the 1st Belarusian Front and the 1st Ukrainian Front forces in the morning of April 16, 1945. The 2nd Belarusian Front was to join the attack four days later. Marshal Georgi Zhukov. While preparing the attack, we were fully aware that the Germans were expecting our attack on Berlin. The German command foresaw this attack and was carefully preparing for defense. They prepared the defense in depth from the Oder to Berlin. In the operational depth, strong reserves were built up and the divisions of the first line were remanned and newly equipped with material. In their zeal to enhance the fortitude of the troops in defense, the German command applied harsher repressive measures. On April 15th, addressing the soldiers of the Eastern Front, Hitler demanded to immediately shoot anyone who would give the order to retreat or retreat without the order. Soviet command based their plans on the four-year war experience and the good training of the troops. Even in 1941, it was rather an exception than the rule to send the soldiers to the front untrained. Usually a team of recruits was sent to the so-called camps, where they received general military training within three months. The soldiers were trained in shooting and the basics of hand and bayonet fighting on the training ground. Kilometers long marches were also a part of the infantry training. Elias Sokolov recalls, In addition to the daily training, they would alarm us almost every night and send to a quick march in full combat gear. You had to run 10 kilometers, dig a foxhole, and wait for the all-clear command, and then you had to run back. After the training, the soldiers were transported to the front by trains. There, the seasoned veterans helped the novices and shared their experience and soldiers' smarts with the young soldiers and officers. However, it could have also happened that the attack began just the next morning after the arrivals of the novices. In such a baptism of fire, one had to use the knowledge and skills that had been practiced during the training. Sometimes the German fire stopped the attack and forced the infantry division to lie down right in the field. Digging foxholes was the only defense method in this case. Lying under the fire, the soldier took his shovel out of its cover and started digging. The small shovel is sometimes referred to as the sapper spade, but this is incorrect. Sapper spades are large entrenchments tools for field fortification. Those together with pickaxes were carried in the unit train and used mostly for defensive organization. But the small shovel was called the infantry shovel and the soldier had to always carry it with him. The novice who threw it away, tried to get rid of the excess weight on the march, was in big trouble. The shovel can serve 
us a hatchet or a machete, but most importantly, under the enemy fire, to take a shelter with the help of it was the only possible way to protect oneself from the enemy bullets. When entrenching, the soldier had first to make a pit for the prone firing position. He threw the ground in front of himself to make an earthen breastwork which protected him from the bullets. According to the military manual, an infantryman was to dig such a pit in 8 to 10 minutes. If the infantry had to hold the line, they first deepened the prone fire pits up to kneeling foxholes, and then up to standing foxholes. If they were holding the defensive line for a long period, the soldiers dug communication trenches to the adjacent foxholes. Thus, the foxholes connected by the communication trenches formed a trench for the whole fire unit. If the unit was standing on the defensive for a day or more, they developed the trench further. They arranged extra firing tables for the machine guns. They made a 30 to 50 meter long communication trench to the rear and dug a two to two and a half meter deep slit trench where soldiers hid during the artillery shelling or air attacks. The positions were being fortified day and night. Both the result of the battle and the very life of the soldier depended on this work. A dugout with the emergency exit was made as a splinter-proof shelter for the soldiers. Niches were made in the walls of the foxholes and communication trenches to store the ammunition and grenades. Often the soldiers slept in these niches themselves. Drains and drainage wells were dug in the trenches for the rain and meltwater. Latrines were arranged in the rear. The communication trenches connected the trench with the neighboring unit's trenches. Thus, small foxholes turned into a whole trench line. The battalion kitchen was placed several hundred meters away from the front line. Hot meals were prepared three times a day. Breakfast at 05 to 0600 a.m., lunch at 12 to 1400, and dinner at 20 to 2100. The meals were delivered in thermoses, but the situation did not always allow doing it. That is why before the dawn the soldiers received dry rations for the whole day. Bacon or cooked meat, canned food, bread. Alexander Rojachev recalls, The food was good, but it was very rarely delivered to the front line. We could have advanced too far or we were under fire and the field kitchen was simply unable to reach us. Sometimes our sergeant crawled up to us and said, Soldiers, lunch. But the peas and meat soup in the thermos was frozen. We could not even stick the spoon in it. We ate it cold. Food was considered the most valuable trophy and often made up for the provisioning failures. Also, the veterans with pleasure recollect the American canned goods, jokingly dubbed the Western Front. The vodka rations, 100 grams per person per day, were only given to the soldiers on the front line and in the cold seasons. Out of the front, the units received vodka only on the national holidays. Sometimes those eager to have a drink added the alcohol trophies or the local home distillated vodka to the assigned rations. However, the distribution of liquor in the army was regulated very strictly. Vasily Gordov recalls, Vodka helped, especially in winter. It made you feel warmer and braver. Of course, you're less smart and skillful when you drink. But in the frontal attacks, one's courage is of most importance. And the infantry was often thrown in the very frontal attacks. During the relocation marches, the infantrymen tried to stay overnight in the local villages, where the soldiers could take up quarters with the villagers. They almost always slept dressed. The nights spent near the front line were even less comfortable. Yuri Koshin recalls, It was a covered trench for three soldiers. There was dry grass at the bottom and a hearth in a hollow in the wall with a vent hole reaching the ground surface. The tubes of artillery gunpowder served us as a fuel. We were burning them until feeling junk because of the powder gases. Then we took off the boots and wrapped our feet with the putties over the foot wraps. We put one coat underneath and covered ourselves with the other two coats. At the beginning of the war, almost all soldiers at the forefront suffered from pediculosis. But by the middle of the war, this problem had already been solved. 
The units were withdrawn from the forefront so that the soldiers could wash themselves. It was not always possible to visit a real bathhouse and the soldiers often had to wash themselves right in the open air. The soldiers shaved themselves with a straight razor. Often due to the lack of mirrors, they shaved each other. Beards and mustaches were allowed only in exceptional cases. Brushing one's teeth or washing one's hands before meals was practically unavailable for the soldiers. One soldier received 150 grams of soap per month, but tooth powder was not included in the ration. It could have been bought in the commissary stores, but they rarely appeared in the forefront areas. The basic infantry weapon in the assault groups throughout the war was the Mosin rifle, or the three-linear rifle. It was a magazine rifle, a five-shooter with bolt action, and it was respected among the infantrymen for being reliable and easy to maintain. The infantrymen would even prefer the three-linear rifle to the more modern models of rifles. Alexander Rochichev recalls, The Mosin rifle was reliable, but we didn't like the Tokarev self-loading rifle. They would jam all the time. The three-linear rifle virtually never broke down. There was nothing to break in it. Moreover, it could be easily assembled and disassembled, and the young soldiers easily learned to handle the Mosin rifle. Due to the geometry of its parts, the dirt which got inside the rifle mechanism with the movements of the bolt was thrown outside or to the trigger slacks. If the bolt was completely covered with sand and would not close anymore, it was enough to just wipe the weapon with whatever wiper, having removed the bolt and the magazine feeder. Even without being cleaned, the three linear rifle could have been used quite long in the forefront conditions. Alexander Azemcha, the second commander of the rifle battalion, recalls. We were moving along the main ridge of the Carpathian Mountains. The automatic weapons would fail because of sand and water. Only the Russian three-linear rifle proved faultless. With its easy maintenance, Masinka exceeded even the basic weapon of the German infantrymen, the Mosser 98K carbine, although in general they were about equal. However, some soldiers felt the three-linear rifle to be handier and better balanced, and therefore more convenient. Besides, the Mosin rifle, with the bayonet fixed on it, became an indispensable weapon for the infantrymen in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. In the 1930s, the Soviet Union enjoyed the huge popularity of the Voroshilovsky Strilak, a Voroshilov-like shooter movement. Many young boys and girls learned the basics of the sniper training, but they were not taught the tactics and handling of the optical sight. From the earliest days of the war, the emergency marksmanship training began and the trainee snipers were using mostly the three-linear Mosin rifle. The only drawback of Mosinka in the sniper's version was the unavailability of magazine loading. The sniper had to insert cartridges one by one. By the end of the war, the importance of the automatic weapons, submachine guns, and machine guns had increased. According to the pre-war Red Army standards, the density of the defensive fire should have made five bullets per one minute per one meter of the front line. But in July of 1941, the average fire density of the Soviet infantry did not exceed two and a half bullets per meter. With every passing month of the war, this figure grew, and in December of 1944, the density the density of the fire made at times up to 10 bullets per minute per meter of the front line. But in 1941, the average number of submachine guns and machine guns in the German infantry division exceeded that of the Soviet division three times. And only by the beginning of 1943, these rates became approximately equal. On the eve of the battle for Berlin, the correlation was different. The Soviet rifle divisions had almost twice as many automatic weapons as a similar German unit. On the way to Berlin, the 
first Belarusian front and the first Ukrainian front were facing the 4th Panzer Army and the 9th Field Army of the Germans, who had taken up positions on the west bank of the Oder. It was obvious that under the onslaught of the Red Army, they would gradually retreat to Berlin and turn it into a fortress with a strong garrison. Then, Georgi Zhukov made a decision which contradicted the recommendations of Stavka, but was approved by Stalin. Zhukov decided to entrap the German troops in the pocket and thus prevent them from retreating to Berlin. It was very difficult to achieve this. The German armies were just a few kilometers from Berlin. Zhukov had to make a lightning stroke to join Marshal Konev's troops of the 1st Ukrainian Front and block the escape route for the German troops. That is why the main attack was directed along the shortest distance across the Silau Heights. The Silau Heights were a chain of hills at the distance of 17 kilometers from the Oder with a perfect view of the entire front line along the river. This was the Germans' second line of defense. This fortified stronghold was kind of the key to Berlin. Taking the Silau Heights, the Soviet troops would get into the rear of the Germans' 4th Panzer Army and the 9th Army, cutting off their retreat to the capital. The German High Command realized that the Soviet attack could begin any day. That is why before the dawn they relocated the troops to the depth of defense in order to avoid losses under the Soviet artillery's preparation bombardment, which usually started with the first rays of the sun. Zhukov took this into account, and the artillery salvos thundered at 3 a.m. Berlin time. On April 16, 1945, the night's darkness was cut with the searchlights, shot up above the Soviet positions. Visible for miles, they were the signal for the artillerymen. Within half an hour, the most powerful artillery preparation of more than a million shells plowed up the first defense line of the enemy. At the beginning of the attack, the infantrymen, as usual, were in the trenches. The neutral zone, just a kilometer wide or a little wider, separated them from the front line of the enemy. It was impossible, of course, to start the attack at this distance. The Germans' machine guns and artillery would simply annihilate the attackers. Therefore, the following tactics were used during the offensive operation. The artillery barraged the front line of the enemy's defense with fire, and the aviation poured bombs. On it. The enemy soldiers were forced to hit the dirt and hide in the shelters. They could not machine gun or fire anymore. Using this advantage, the advanced units of the Soviet infantry began to approach the enemy. The infantrymen moved as close as possible to the first line of the German trenches. At the same time, the tanks were put forward. With their splinter-proof armor, they could hug the friendly artillery barrage, suppressing the enemy fire nests from the tank guns. When the infantry reached the line of departure, the Soviet artillery retargeted the fire into the depth of the German defense. Now the shells were pouring over the second line of German trenches. It was as if the attacking troops were led by the artillery fire. At this very moment, the infantry stood up and attacked. On the commander's signal, the soldiers rushed forward. They had to move quickly before the dazed enemy opened the return fire. The slightest delay deprived the infantry of all the benefits gained by the artillery barrage and caused useless losses. The vanguard units, almost without stops, crossed the first line of the German trenches and rushed forward. They had to attack the second line of the defense. The tanks rushed forward, clearing the way for the infantry. Meanwhile, the rear guard teams mopped up the captured trenches. Moving along the intricacies of the German defense positions, the attackers annihilated the enemy soldiers remaining in the machine gun bunkers and fire nests. Then the captured positions were prepared for defense, in case of the enemy's counterattacks. Having captured the second line of the German trenches, the infantry vanguard improvised a defense. They knew that behind them, in the rear, there were fortified positions already. After being reinforced, the infantry moved forward, as far as the situation permitted it, expanding the offensive on the right and left flanks. Evgeny Besinov recalls, 
The challenge for the platoon commander here was not to let the soldiers hit the dirt, so I had to run forward shouting, Go! As a rule, the enemies ran away, and we dropped flat in their trenches, hardly breathing, or continued the pursuit if we were able to. During the first half an hour of the Soviet attack on the Silao Heights, there was no return fire from the German side, but soon the streams and canals blocked the attackers' advance. The tanks and mobile guns started lagging behind the infantry. At the dawn, the enemy guns and mortars revived and started firing at the Soviet troops moving along the roads. At the same time, the best German units withdrawn from the defense of Berlin were moving closer to the Silao Heights. Nikolai Sefanov recalls, We attacked the Silao Heights, and it was something terrible. Out of 120 soldiers in our company, only about 20 people survived. The veterans would say that it was even worse there than it had been in Stalingrad. The Silao Heights were captured within just two days. Zhukov managed to pocket the German army of 200,000 men and to defeat it. The Battle of the Silao Heights was a costly one for the Red Army. It cost thousands of deaths and thousands of injuries of varying severity. But the defeat of main forces of the Wehrmacht's Ninth Army prevented even higher losses that the Soviet troops could have suffered when storming Berlin. At noon on April 25th, the Soviet troops closed the encirclement of Berlin. The defense of the German capital consisted of three lines. For the convenience of the management, Berlin was divided into nine sectors. The outer or the perimeter defense line surrounded the city along the highway at 15 to 18 miles from the center. The network of fixed positions arranged in a checkboard pattern was reinforced by the abundant natural obstacles found in the vicinity of Berlin. The lakes, rivers, ponds, and dense field woodlands. The second, middle defense perimeter, was stretched along the Spree River and the Teltow Canal. Most of the bridges across the river and the canal had been undermined. The third, inner defense line, of the powerful permanent fire nests surrounded the government offices in the city center. All the buildings were prepared for defense against the all-around fire. The premises on the upper floors were occupied with machine guns, submachine gunners, and the groups armed with Faust patrols. Behind each house, they had dug trenches for the anti-tank guns and had dug in the tanks and trench mortars. The streets were barricaded. However, due to the defeat of the main German's forces on the Silao Heights in the capital was defended by the garrison of 100,000 men and 60 tanks. Only a half of the garrison was manned with the regular army soldiers and officers, but the Germans fought desperately for their capital. Siegfried Knapp recalls, It was clear from the beginning that we did not have any chance. But we stalled for time, waiting for the Western troops to get to Berlin. Outnumbering the enemy with men and material, the Red Army could not fully use these advantages in the quarters of the huge city turned into a fortress. The tanks could not maneuver on the narrow streets of Berlin, and one could have expected a phosphor drone to be shot from behind every house and out of any window. In this situation, during the street battles they applied the tactics of the assault groups which had proved effective in Stalingrad. The rifle company was reinforced with two to three tanks, a mobile gun, a demining unit, wiremen and artillerymen. Mikhail Katukov, commander of the 1st Guards Tank Army. The D-miners and submachine gunners tracked away for the tanks, drawing out the Faust Patron shooters. Only two tanks at a time could move along the narrow streets. The first tanks were firing, and the next ones were on the queue. If one of the tanks was out of action, it was replaced by the other one. German infantrymen armed with Faust patrons were particularly dangerous in the city. 
They were moving fast, shooting from any convenient position, and almost always managing to hit the target, disabling the tank and its crew. In order to protect their vehicle, some of the Soviet tankers tried to use the special gratings, which should have neutralized the FOSS patrons before its contact with the armor. But the effectiveness of these devices was low. That is why the infantrymen had to vigilantly monitor the windows of the nearby buildings, above all, annihilating FOSS patron shooters. In their turn, the tanks fired the tank guns and machine guns destroying the enemy firing positions in the remote buildings, which prevented the infantry from the further advance and gave covering fire to the sappers with their explosive charges. The infantry checked the basements, buildings, yards. The assault teams moved forward through the basements and apartments, breaking through the walls and taking in the rear of the Germans' defense. As for the barricades, debris and other obstacles, they simply got around them. After the infantry passed, the deminers started clearing the streets from the barricades. The subway and the sewer tunnels were almost never used. Firstly, the Soviet soldiers did not have the plans of these constructions, and most of their exits were blocked with the debris. Secondly, many of the tunnels were flooded, and some of the subway stations served as shelter for Berliners. When moving through the residential areas, the following method was also used. Certain artillery batteries moved one and a half to two kilometers forward, deployed quickly on the street corners and opened fire, targeting the windows, doorways, and basements of the buildings. The batteries advanced by leapfrogs. While one battery gave covering fire, the other battery was moving. This tactic enabled the infantry to quickly follow the artillery, discouraged and demoralized the enemy, and broke the enemy's fire, control, and communication systems. By April 28th, the defenders of Berlin had controlled only the central part of the city, all of which was fired through the Soviet artillery. The city lay in ruins in front of us, with fires raging here and there. There was soot and the smell of burning in the air. The streets and alleys were blocked with barricades of steel hedgehogs, concrete beams, stone barrels, sandbags. The gunfire was heard everywhere. By the evening of April 28th, the units of the 3rd Attack Army of the 1st Belarusian Front entered the Reichstag area. The building of the German parliament was defended by 5,000 strong garrison, and the attempt to take it in stride proved unsuccessful. At the Konigsplatz Square, there was no heavy artillery, which could have broken the solid walls of the Reichstag. Despite the heavy losses, all the soldiers who were still able to attack were gathered in composite battalions at the front line for the final decisive assault. Vasily Yustyagov recalls, By that time there remained about one battalion in each of our assault regiments. There was a battalion commander there who had only two soldiers and he attacked anew. The sappers managed to make a breach in the northwestern wall of the Reichstag, and a group of Soviet soldiers stormed into the building. Almost simultaneously, the soldiers of the 150th Rifle Division, supported by the artillery, stormed into the main entrance. We were rushing towards the Reichstag. The soldiers of Zinchenko's and Pokhodinov's regiments were running close to us. Everything was mixed up there. There was no clearly defined battle array. Then, only 50, 30, 20 meters were left. And finally, we reached the broad staircase leading to the main entrance of the Reichstag. There was an incredible whirl of people, exclamations and commands there. The wounded soldiers were calling the lifesavers. Those slain by a bullet fell on their backs. Lyadov was the first of us who ran up to the column and fixed his flag on it. There was a crowd at the doors. They were boarded up. The attempt of a large number of people to break open the doors with their shoulders was no success. The soldiers brought in wooden logs. Hundreds of hands lifted them and started ramming the doors. A few powerful blows and it swung open with a bang. The 
infantry was moving inside the Reichstag from one floor to the next. Every soldier had a red flag or a piece of red cloth with him. The soldiers hanged them out the windows to indicate the floor which had been already captured for the Soviet artillery. On the same day, the upper floors of the parliament were occupied by the Soviet troops, and only a group of Nazis hiding in the basements continued the resistance. They hoped to break out by cutting off the Soviet soldiers in the building from the major troops. On the last day of April, the attack flag of the 150th Rifle Division was hoisted over the Reichstag. Two soldiers from the reconnaissance platoon were selected to hoist the flag. Sergeant Mikhail Yegorov and Junior Sergeant Melitin Kantaria. During the battle for the Reichstag, they were moving to the upper floors together with the infantrymen. The entire second floor was clear. Yegorov and Kantaria, covered by the group of Alexei Berest, were breaking through to the upper floors. Suddenly, a whole stone staircase broke and fell down, but there was no long delay. I'll be right back. Kentaria shouted and rushed somewhere down. He soon appeared with a wooden ladder, and the men went on climbing up stubbornly. Finally, they were on the roof. The reconnaissance officers came up to the tremendous horsemen. In front of them, there were buildings wrapped up with the smoky twilight. There were suddenly flashes all around. The shell splinters were knocking against the roof. Where were they to fix the flag? Near the statue? No, it was not right. They were ordered to fix it straight on the dome. The ladder leading to the dome was unsteady. It was damaged in several places. The soldiers started climbing up the widely spaced edges of the dome frame. It was difficult and scary to move. They climbed slowly, one after the other, hanging on for dear life. Finally, the reconnaissance men reached the top platform. They tightened the banner against the metal bar with the belt and climbed down the same way. Commander of the 150th Division, Major General Vasily Shatilov. When Yigorov and Kantaria appeared before the battalion commander, Ustroyev, the watch showed 10 minutes to 11 p.m. And five minutes later, the regiment commander, Zinchenko, solemnly informed me by telephone. Comrade General, the banner of the Military Council was fixed on the dome of the Reichstag at 2150 Moscow time. But the battle for the Parliament building continued all the next day, and only on the night of May 2nd, the Reichstag garrison capitulated. After midnight, on the night of May 2nd, the radio stations of the 1st Belarus Front received the message in Russian, Cease the fire. Truce envoys are sent to the Potsdam Bridge. The German officer who arrived at the appointed place on behalf of the Commandant of Berlin, General Weidling, informed that the Berlin garrison was ready to stop the resistance. At 6 a.m. on May 2nd, General Weidling, accompanied by three German generals, crossed the front line and capitulated. An hour later, at the headquarters of the 8th Guards Army, he wrote the order for capitulation. The order was copied, and the German units defending the center of Berlin were informed about it through loudspeakers and by radio. Gradually, the resistance in the city stopped. By the end of the day, the troops of the 8th Guard Army had mopped up the central part of Berlin. Several units that kept fighting tried to break through to the west, but were annihilated or dispersed. The Supreme Military Order of Victory was instituted in 1943. It was awarded to the military commanders of the highest level. In total, during the Great Patriotic War, there were 16 holders of this order. Generalissimo of the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin, and Marshals Georgi Zhukov and Alexander Vasilevsky received it twice. The names of the recipients are engraved on the memorial plaque installed in the Grand Kremlin Palace. This is one of the rarest orders in the world. Now, the original order of victory can be seen in the Diamond Fund in the Kremlin. 
Each of the five rubies weighs five carats. The total weight of the 174 diamonds on the order makes 16 carats. After the capitulation of Berlin and the loss of the vital parts of the country, Germany completely lost the opportunity to continue organized resistance. It took the Red Army less than a month to have broken the Oder Neisse defensive line, penetrating through the numerous natural obstacles fortified by the enemy at the front to 400 kilometers, and to have approached Berlin. The ten days of the bloody fighting ended with the defeat of the Nazi grouping in the capital of Germany. The processions of prisoners, headed by the officers and generals, were moving gloomily along the streets of the capital in defeat. The Wehrmacht's eastern campaign ended not with the parade in Moscow the Nazis had been screaming about to the whole world, but with their complete defeat and the surrender of Berlin. Building on the offensive, the Soviet troops reached the Elbe, where they allied with the U.S. and British troops. It was less than a week to the victory. The battles on the following days were actually the agony of the already defeated Germany. It was the last month of the spring, of the main spring, the spring of victories.